Good morning, everyone. My name is Daniel Molinuevo. I'm the research manager at the EU agency Eurofound, and I'm delighted to be able to participate at this event today. Now, I'm not able to be with you neither in person nor online because I'm actually on parental leave at the moment. So there's some other types of, let's say, family development activities that are taking up most of my time. But it's nevertheless great to be able to discuss with you um, opportunities for advocacy at the EU level. And I believe this is a very timely event to do so because we're at the beginning of a new policy cycle. So we had elections in June and now as we're speaking, decisions are being made as to who will be the different commissioners for the different portfolios. So it's important to get a sense of what the new policy cycle could look like and how it will affect children and families. So in the first part of my presentation, I will be focusing on the information that we have so far about policies for children and families in the new policy cycle. Because child poverty it has been featuring in the last few years very strongly in the EU policy agenda and it is very likely that it will be the case as well in the next few years. I'm going to focus the second part of my presentation on how we measure child poverty and I believe that's very important to get an understanding of how we define and how we measure child poverty when we do advocacy activities and also to get a sense of what is the current situation when we talk about child poverty and what are the trends, what have been the developments over the last few years. Now, whenever we talk about social policies at the EU level, including those that are more relevant for children and families, I believe that it's important to start by talking about the European pillar of social rights. Because since 2017, this pillar has been the cornerstone providing guidance when it comes to deal with socioeconomic challenges. It is a pillar that is composed by 20 statements dealing with different areas of labor and social policy. And I will not be going in detail into all 20 statements. You can find more information about these statements and also some background information on the pillar in this link. But I just want to say that these are statements that are linked to specific targets to be achieved by 2030. And progress towards achieving this target is measured in what is called the social scoreboard, which is basically a set of indicators that measures whether we're making progress towards achieving these goals. And you can find the set of, this set of indicators that describes the progress made so far in the, the link below. Now, what does the, the European pillar say about support for children? So we have a section called Child and Support to Children, where emphasis is put on two areas. The first one being early childhood education and care, also called childcare. And this is an area where there's been a long standing interest of the EU institutions in ensuring that there's affordable um, early childhood education and care for all children, childcare of good quality. And there's been a number of policy initiatives at the EU level in order to ensure this, first of all, the Barcelona targets, so an, an, which are participation rate objectives that have been set in 2002. They were revised in 2022. There's also targets and activities in the so-called uh, European education area. And so that's, that's an aspect where there's been a lot of emphasis at the EU level because of it's important for work-life balance and to, in order to increase employment and, part and activity rates so that parents can um, actually participate in the labor market. That's one aspect. And then the other one is protection from poverty and ensuring that children from disadvantaged backgrounds have the right to specific measures to enhance equal opportunities. So there's, there's as part of the objectives that are including the social scoreboard and targets to be achieved by 2030, we have that the EU has committed to reduce the number of children at risk of poverty and social exclusion by at least 5 million by the end of the decade. How are these objectives going to be achieved at the EU level in the current landscape? Um, how are these targets and principles that were set in 2017 materialized in, in 2024? So we have a good uh, sense of how this is going to happen 
in the so-called La ULP Declaration on the Future of the European Pillar of Social Rights. This is a declaration that was signed at a high-level conference in April of this year, and the declaration basically shows how the EU social agenda will pan out in the next few years. And obviously, it's up to the new Commission uh, to decide the specific work program to achieve the European Pillar of Social Rights. But what's important about this declaration is its widespread consensus. So it was signed not only by all the EU institutions, but by 25 out of 27 member states, and also by civil society and social partners. So it's a, um, a declaration that really sets out what are the agreements and the latest thinking when it comes to uh, social policy at the EU level. What do we have in, in terms of achieving the pillar of social rights in the area of children and families in this declaration? Well, first, we have a commitment to reach the uh, new Barcelona targets on participation rates in early childhood education and care. And this shows that really early childhood education and care is one of the key areas when it comes to policies for children and families at the EU level. So you'll see it over, coming up over and over in different EU policies. And what's important here is that there's a commitment not only to increase the quantity of childcare, to increase participation rates, but also the quality. And more importantly, that there's an acknowledgement that the, those providing services for children in childcare are key when it comes to guarantee the accessibility and the quality of services. So there's specific mention there of workforce professionalization and fair working conditions, because this is a sector where there's a hard turnover. People move from childcare to working in edu primary education whenever they have the opportunity, because working conditions are, are better. And so this is an area where now there's a higher emphasis at the EU level uh, to ensure that there's no trade-offs between higher quantity of places in detriment of the quality of those services. And then there's a, a commitment to strengthen and ensure the implementation of the European Child Guarantee. The European Child Guarantee is the, the key uh, policy at the EU level when it comes to tackling child poverty. It has been set out in 2021, and I'll talk a little bit uh, uh, more about it later on in the presentation. But suffice to say that um, the implementation has been delayed. Some countries have only put national action plans to implement the child guarantee in, in their own country uh, much later than what was scheduled. And so there's a commitment here to ensure that this policy works at the EU level and at the national level, and putting a lot of emphasis on making sure that the monitoring of the, the guarantee is as holistic as possible. So this is where the um, most widespread consensus is. And then after the, uh, the elections, we had that Commissioner von der Leyen put together a set of political guidelines for the new European Commission. And this is a very valuable document to have a look at because it really shows how these general principles in the European Pillar of Social Rights and then how the consensus on to how to implement and strengthen the European Pillar of Social Rights is going to be implemented in practice in the next few years. So you can see here that there would be a new action plan with specific measures year by year as to how to implement the European Pillar of Social Rights and to achieve those goals stated in the pillar by 2030. And very importantly, this will include having for the very first time an EU anti-poverty strategy. Hence the need um, of having a good understanding of how we measure poverty, or in particular child poverty, which is what I will discuss in the second part of my presentation. You see here as well that there's once again an emphasis on ensuring that the child guarantee is strengthened. And so that this key policy to tackle child poverty is actually delivered successfully. And there's lastly, there's a several measures in the area of housing, including having a new commissioner on, on specifically on, on housing, which is a first when it comes to the European Commission. You will have seen in a lot of these documents that's mentioned to the European Child Guarantee and it, the importance to ensure that it's implemented successfully. 
What is digital guarantees? It's a recommendation that was established in June 2021, and its role is to tackle child poverty by ensuring access to specific services, namely healthcare, childcare, and primary and secondary education, and then ensuring that there's access to what we could call resources, being um, having um, nutrition and decent housing. So, as part of the implementation of the child guarantee, member states uh, were supposed to appoint uh, child guarantee national coordinators that oversees the measures put in place in, in its country. And these measures are brought together in a national action plan. And then every two years, there, there is a report on progress in the so-called implementation plans. So the first batch of reporting took place in March this year, and you can find in the European Child Guarantee Commission website, the implementation reports that are available. The next batch of implementation plans is foreseen to be submitted in 2026. And also in 2026, there will be a midterm review of the child guarantee. So five years after the um, approval of the recommendation, it was stated that there will be a review to see whether the objectives are, are being achieved. And so hence the emphasis in a lot of the documents on uh, making sure that the monitoring of the guarantee is in place and that is robust and complete enough. And you, you can see in the previous documents that there's a lot of interest in ensuring that we arrive to this midterm review with a full-fledged guarantee. Lastly, when it comes to your policies, you will have seen that a lot of them, not only the child guarantee, deal with a target group which is children at risk of poverty and social exclusion, the acronym being AROPI. And that is the measurement of child poverty uh, or poverty in general, when we talk about AROPI, but also child poverty. And I will be talking more in detail of how we measure this in practice, because I think that's key when it comes to advocacy activities. It's important to, to have a grasp of how we measure poverty and child poverty, because what I found in um, many different policy statements at the EU level is that sometimes it is stated that rather than child poverty, we should be looking at the poverty uh, or the um, welfare situation of the household in general or of families in as a whole or of, of parents. Now, uh, the problem with that is that does not take into account that actually the measurement of child poverty includes items that are related to the individual, so the, the children, but also the, the situation of the parents and the situation of the household in general. So of course, one can have an opinion of whether more emphasis should be put on, on one aspect over the other, but to say that there's a trade-off between child, looking at child poverty and the, the poverty of the household as a whole, that is, that is a, a false dichotomy. The child poverty measurement include different items pertaining to different levels of the household. So when we define child poverty, first of all, we're looking at persons under age 18 that are at risk of poverty or social exclusion or AROPI. And this is a very multifaceted indicator. So we're looking, first of all, at a risk of poverty rate or, let's say, monetary poverty. Then we're looking at material and social deprivation. And then we're also looking at a low work intensity indicator in the, in the household. You can find more information about these different aspects of uh, the uh, child poverty indicators in our website. You have there a monitor that do, does not only include child poverty measurement and analysis, but also the situation and the indicators in the other aspects of the child guarantee, namely education, childcare, nutrition, housing, and so on. With an, including the analysis. So that is a resource that you can use when it comes to draft your advocacy strategies, because you find there the different aspects of child well-being then the latest data available. Let's have a look at the latest data available for the indicator of child poverty. And what we find here is that over the last 10 years or so, so since 2015, there's been an improvement in the situation. So the ROP rate for children has decreased from 27.4% to 24.8% um, at the EU level. 
But it's important to look not only at the last 10 years, but also to look at trends for the latest data. And here what we see is that numbers are up since the beginning of the pandemic. So we're reversing the trend. That was a positive trend in, in terms of the improvement of the situation. So that's something you can see here. This is the child poverty rate since 2015. And you can see that were very high in, back in 2015. And there was a steady decline up until 2019. And then things have started to worsen little by little since 2020. So this is an, an area where it's important to pay attention and how to mitigate in uh, the next few years this negative trend because the all the gains that were achieved in the last decade or so they're they're being uh, reversed that would be the overall type of the indicator or rop indicator and let's have a closer look at the different components that are part of this rop indicator and the first one is a risk of poverty rate so a rope instead of a row P. And what we're looking here is a monetary, monetary poverty. So it's the percentage of persons aged under 18 that are in households with an income below the 60% median equivalent disposable income after social um, transfers, which is a very long way of saying low income households. And then here, what we see as well is that there's been a decrease over the last few years. Uh, but a slightly less pronounced decrease. So here we've only reduced since 2020 from 21% uh, to 19% in 2023. And I believe that in our addition to these EU averages, what is important is that we look at why these changes happen by analyzing further the national level. So we need to avoid having improvements in the EU average that are only driven by a set of few countries that are improving the situation and then the others uh, have the same situation. So having a look at whether countries are converging or diverging when it comes to their performance in relation to the um, EU average is crucial because that's one of the key aspects of the cohesion at the EU level. We're talking about an ever closer union, and that means having countries that come closer together. And that is something that we see um, in child poverty in general, but not when it comes to monetary poverty. Here, what has happened is we have more disparities between member states in the period from 2010 to 2023. There has been a catch up effect, meaning that some countries that had high monetary poverty rates like Poland and Hungary have improved their performance steadily. But overall, overall there's been an increase in disparities, which is something that, as we said, we, need to, uh, we want to avoid because even if there's an improvement in averages at the EU level, that is masks the fact that the, some countries are doing much worse than others. The second item or indicator that is part of this AROPI indicator, the overall child poverty indicator, is the severe material and social deprivation rate for children. This is an indicator that measures the percentage of children that are an experience and enforced lack of at least of 7 out of 13 deprivation items. And again, this is an indicator that shows that there's no trade-off between talking about child poverty and, and uh, taking um, account of the situation of the household as a whole, because we're talking about items that are related to individual, but also others that have to do with a, a household. As you can see the full list of items that are considered in the link there. And this range from not being able to afford rent or utility bills, not being able to keep the home adequately warm, facing unexpected expenses, being able to afford eating meat, fish or protein every second day, being able to afford a holiday away from home, having access to a car for personal use, replace worn out furniture, worn out clothes, and the list goes on. So it's a very comprehensive list. And here, once again, we see that in the last decade or so, there's been an improvement of the situation. So the percent of children that were in this situation of severe material and social deprivation has decreased slightly. Um, again, the situation has uh, improved over the last decade, but then we see a worsening of the situation since the beginning of the pandemic. 
But here we have a different situation from what we saw in monetary poverty when it comes to disparities between member states. So there's been a um, decrease in these disparities in the sense that countries are converging towards one another because their national average is closer to the EU average. So that is a positive development. The last indicator that is used to measure our, our OP is uh, children living in a household with very low work intensity. What we're looking at here is the percent of children that are living in households where the adults work 20% uh, of less of their working time potential during the previous year. And this is calculated excluding those that are not in the labor market because they are studying or because they are retired or they live in a household where the main income comes from, from pensions. And what we have here, as in the other cases, is that there's been an improvement of the situation in the last 10 years. But then again, it's useful to look at this, the reduction of disparities. So here, the reduction of disparities was steady. So there was an improvement when it comes to convergence between member states between 2015 and 2020. And then with the pandemic, disparities rose between 2020 and 2021. And then there's been a, an improvement of the situation between 2022 and 2023 in the sense that we went back to a positive trend of a reduction of those disparities. So let's sum up the, the main points made in this presentation. So first and foremost, I believe that this new policy cycle at the EU level that starts now opens opportunities for advocacy in the area of child poverty. And that child poverty is one of the key areas if we're looking at advocating for children and families at the EU level. We can see that it's been mentioned in uh, different documents for which there's a widespread consensus, not only when it comes to key players like von der Leyen, but also as we saw in uh, declarations like the Declaration of La Ulp that bring together um, those at the national level, civil society, and also social partners. Because of that, it's very important to understand what are we talking about when we talk about child poverty and to get a good understanding of the indicator ROP, because as we've seen, that encompasses different dimensions that pertain not only to the situation of children as individuals, but also we look at other aspects like um, um, house work intensity in the household, um, monetary poverty, that also deal with the situation of parents and of the household as a whole. When we're looking or advocating for measures to tackle child poverty, it's important to have a sense of trends over time. And here, it's important to understand that while there's been an improvement of the situation in the last decade or so, we're now in a negative trend since the pandemic that um, we risked to have a um, reversion or uh, uh, going back to a situation that where we had higher child poverty rates. So again, um, we need to have policy advocacy activities that make sure that we do not uh, revert the, the trend and go back to a negative trend of increasing child poverty rates. And lastly, I, I think it's important to look at EU and national averages in combination. And by that, I don't mean like you see in a lot of presentations in Brussels to have bar charts with the EU average and then all member states, but to understand the interaction. So we need to see whether national averages are coming closer to the EU average um, because it's important to have convergence and cohesion at the EU level to achieve the ever closer union. That is one of the guiding principles of the union. And because otherwise we risk that these improvements at the EU level are actually masking uh, situations at the national level where we have a stagnating or a worsening of the, the situation. Thanks for your attention and apologies again, I could not be with you in person, but I want to leave you with a set of resources that I believe could be valuable for your advocacy activities. First of all, the link to the Child Guarantee Monitor that I mentioned before, where you can have information about trends, the definitions of indicators, and description of the current situation in different aspects of the well-being of children, including child poverty. And then I want to uh, announce that we will have more up-to-date data as well as a closer look 
on the situation of those working for children, which is something that was mentioned in Laul de declaration um, at the beginning of next year. So we will be having a report bringing together this overview of the situation of children together with an analysis of the situation of those working for children. Thank you very much for your attention.